Africa, the black heron takes the business of shading its eyes very seriously indeed. Does everyone have clickers? Yeah. You don't, you don't need to get them out today because I'm having trouble having my computer connect, though I'm sure everyone has them. Maybe cutting out reflections is not the only reason for doing um. this. Many fish prefer to swim yeah, beneath an overhanging like bank or a tree so that they can't yeah. be easily seen. And the website hasn't thought how to wear So perhaps like they deliberately take shelter under the heron's right, wings. So today we have which of course boring. could be a mistake. Um, this may not be exceptional, I'm not sure, but to me this is more boring than most people have been. Um, we're laying jargon. So just the basic terms you need to know. Okay. Um, and I'll go back to prophecies next 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 lecture. Okay? And so we'll come back to this bird and what, what it's doing and what, what this illustrates. Okay. So, first definition, species. What's a species? Which definition do you believe? Which one do you believe? Well, I've been in college, so I really just deal with morphologically distinct. Is so something morphologically distinct? So I can't tell if they breed or not. Okay. Uh, what's your criterion for the morphologically distinct? I mean, my hand's distinct from my foot, but they're not different species. Well, that's one of the errors that's been propagated in paleontology. You know, there are three different species that ended up being part of the same tree. Mm -hmm. so, okay. Uh, hopefully, you have actual separate organisms. Okay. And even if they're separate, so, you know, males and females often show dimorphism. dimorphism. And so, are they the same species? Presumably, you, you think they should be. Well, if you can find further examples of an ontogeny and then you can tell the difference in the way, then you can establish that they're a dimorphous organism with the same species. But otherwise, it's, they're listed as separate species and so you can prove otherwise. Mm -hmm. And by the way, ontogeny means development. Not sure. Okay. What do people think are species? Yeah. Um, a category of biological classification <laughs> ranking <laughs> genus or subgenus comprising related organisms or populations potentially capable of interbreeding and being designated by a binomial that consists of the name of the genus followed by a Latin or Latinized uncapitalized name. <laughs> <laughs> so, so without the Latin, they're not species? Uh, I really thought it had to do with interbreeding. Too. Okay. Like the lowest possible classification you can have between two organisms that can Reproduce and produce viable offspring. Okay. So, about interbreeding, good. What about so, you know, you know, two males in our species that can't interbreed and have fertile offspring, right? So, that's the same species. Uh, did you need to cover all of the different facets? Well, maybe. I mean, it's, um, so what I'm trying to do is have you bring up a de definition, and I'll try to get exceptions to it, and so we can sort of hack our way through and see how difficult it is. Just like real text on this. Yeah. So that's good. <laughs> what else? What do people think? Don't I won't be that mean. I kind of appreciate the, the transient species concept for just lack of species. I sort of when do you aside from like uh, when you can tell they're interbreeding, but on a geological time scale, how do you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the fact that you have species you're talking about the other day, right? So, you know, humans change through time. It's not like at some point, boom, you know, I'm a new species. Look, I have no brow ridge. You know, it's just it ch changes gradually, right? What about asexual organisms? So there's some lizards that are only female. All right, how do you tell that's one species or 40 species? Yeah, so you see this is tricky, right? We're speechless. So for reasons like this, biologists have made a whole plethora of species concepts. Okay. I don't need you to learn all of these. One thing that one you should probably learn is biological species concept, because that's the most popular. Okay. Um, and basically what biological species concept says is species are groups of interbreeding natural populations 
that are isolated from other such groups. Okay. Now, this doesn't deal with asexual species, right? So things like you know most bacteria, or those lizards, or various other you know some fish that are asexual, right? So what people do there is sort of say, well, these things seem different enough, or these things are you know belonging other group, but like you know select, select it on, um, with like the population of workforce have been selected as this population. Okay, they might just have sort of rules of thumb. If they're different, different by less than five percent at sixteen s, they're a species. Okay. <coughs> and now the problem with this is that speciation is a continuous thing. So not only does one species grade into another, when I have one species becoming two, right? Like bonobos and chimps were separated by a river, well, in two different species, right? When you know, at one point you say, "Up, oh, yep, they're different species," right? Because they probably stop breeding right away. But that they're perfectly identical, if they could hop on a raft, they could breed perfectly well. Right? But over time, they evolve different, you know, behavioral differences and perhaps just different genetic differences that make them not able to breed anymore. Right? There's no you know, finite cutoff of boom. Right? There are cichlid fish species that have been separated for 15 million years. But you put them in a tank together and they can mate and have fertile offspring. Right? So are they all one species? Well, in nature, they don't do that. Right? So it's always this fuzzy gray area. Okay? And at some point, it becomes different. I mean, I'm not going to mate with an oak tree successfully. You know, we just cannot have offspring with different species. You know, <coughs> so you know, at some point you get this difference, but it can be fuzzy for a long time. Okay, like a lot of biology, biology is fuzzy. Okay, but here are various other species concepts that have been proposed. Okay. Any questions about this? And some people actually think we should just get rid of species entirely. Okay, same way people sort of don't people aren't interested in like families. Like, you know, we talk about mammals. Mammals are class, they in order if they are family. I'm not saying mammals doesn't depend on what they are, right? And so a lot of people are sort of moving away from that sort of rank taxonomy. Um, not everyone. And species is also sort of a rank. When do you achieve species rank versus just being separate populations? Okay, so it's sort of an arbitrary cut up because of this fuzziness. Okay. But it is often a useful thing to think about as a species. It's useful in conservation too. Okay. Questions? Okay. How does speciation happen? Well, one way of categorizing it is based on geography. Okay. What does aloe mean? Separate? Uh, it's different, yeah. I don't like British LO. Nice. Yeah, separate, right? And then Patrick? Aren't you patriotic? No? Um, country. Separate country. Okay. Sim Patrick. Same country. Okay. Para Patrick? Yeah, you too. Okay, again, it comes back to that, you know, a lot of other processes have these gray area. And so, species can happen allopathically. So they have a population, and then there's some barrier to gene flow, like a river, and then they evolve separately. Okay, allopathic speciation. And we see lots of cases like this. So, like chimps and bonobos are separated by a river, right? And you know, or we see animals isolated on islands, or plants isolated on islands, where like, a few individuals manage to get to the island. There's not enough gene flow to maintain population cohesion. As they evolve separately. Okay. Sympatric means they, you know, even within like cruising range of each other, they become two different species. Okay. Now we have lots of evidence for allopatric speciation. There's not much, there's no, there's maybe a handful at most of, you know, solid examples of sympatric speciation. Okay. There's a, a pair of, pine, of palm trees on an island. Where the island's very small and the palm trees differ on which what they what grant what terrain they grow on. Okay, and so I thought, okay, well it just might be and it's such a small island that they can definitely pollinate each other. So it's probably a case of sympatric speciation. Lots of other cases you don't know was sympatric or the allopatric and that range is expanded again. Okay, was it sort of parapatric? And again, you know, it's a continuum. Okay. <coughs> and for a while, it's a very hot topic in biology to say, can sympatric speciation happen at all? Okay. And so a lot of people, people, people here 
develop mathematical models of how sympathetic speciation can work. Right? If you think about what's, what's happening, we start off here with everyone interbreeding happily. We get down here with you know the purple ones interbreed with each other and the yellow ones interbreed with each other. Don't interbreed with each other, right? Um, no purple to yellow. How does that happen in a pop in a continuous population? Right? Because imagine like the first purple one appears, say, there's no one to mate with. Right? So that wouldn't work. So how do you get this this difference? Okay. Um, and there are various theories of how this can happen. One is different ecological niches. So you can say if I have a you know, I, I, I eat seeds, and my seed nutrition is like this, these two peaks, right? Well, it could be that, you know, I start off the population here, and those that are, have smaller beaks, those that have bigger beaks do better. And this disruptive selection. Right? And if I happen to, you know, the small beak ones find the small beaks sexy, and the big beak ones find big beaks sexy, and like, you know, oh, you look like me, awesome, right? Then you can have this sort of mating by size. And start having, you know, these that mate with the small ones, and so the small ones diverge, diverge from the big ones. That's one model. Um, other models are sort of traits that, you know, both encode <coughs> preference for the trait and display the trait. So I have a green beard, and I really like people that have green beards. So I'll marry a woman who has a green beard. Um, that sort of thing. The green beard actually is going to be able to use for group selection. But we'll talk about that later. Yeah. Would Darwin's mention be an example of sympatric? Good question. So, what are Darwin's finches? It's actually, there are actually examples of both, just allopatric and then evolving from the, mainland to the island, but within the islands, you see the sympatric with that example you used right there. It's, you see. Yeah. So, Darwin's finches, Darwin and the Galapagos, looking at birds. Shooting birds, actually. Um, and you'll have, on an island, you'll have some pictures of big beaks, some pictures of small beaks, maybe. OK? And it could be that some of those are sympatrically evolved, so there's one for an island that's diverged into two. Or it could be that this species evolved and then moved over to here, and then you know, there's a small species that's been displaced from it. So it could be a mixture of both. I don't think there's a, there's a clear definitive case of sympatric speciation there, but it could have, could have happened. Yeah. And here's where looking at phylogenies helps, too. So I find that on this island, these two are each other's closest relatives, then it could be sympatric speciation. But I find that this, all the big ones form a clade, and all the little ones form a clade, with all these splits being between islands, that suggests allopatric speciation. Make sense? So these terms are good to know. OK, so phylogenetics. We're going to get more into phylogenetics later. I just want to give you some of the jargon now about phylogenetics. So here is a population of species of individual right? Male and female. Okay. So they evolve along happily, and then the triangle appears. Right? A river, a mountain, something. And now they're going to evolve separately. And so the population starts diverging. Okay. So when we summarize this, you know, complex history of a tree is this: A, then B and C. Right. Very simple split. There we go. Um, if you think about looking down on the tree from the top, from on top, we have this set of nestings, right? So these two form a group, and then these two form a group, these two form a group, and these four form a group. All the way down the tree. Okay. And when you think about that way, you don't think about it as like, oh, this is more involved than that one or something. It's different groups of nestings all the way down. Okay. And so, you know, the way if you can draw it both ways, the way you typically draw it is this way. It gives you more information about So more tree jargon. So it's going to say tree, it's going to say phylogeny. If it has no meaningful branch length, it's a cladogram. If you're into math, it's a connected graph with no cycles. So if you go from any point to another point, you're going to path. Right, if there's a cycle, if there's a line connecting here to here, I could go down this way or across. Right? 
but strictly speaking, a tree doesn't have that. Now, in real life, of course, there might be that, right? It could be hybridization happening. So there could be lines where genes can flow across. And we're just now developing methods to deal with that. Okay? But they're not technically true. Okay, the tip of a tree is known as a taxon. We call them OTU, Operational Taxon Units. In math speak, we call it leaf. Okay. We call it terminal, or we call it terminal node. All those terms are used. They remember the slides we put up online with PDF and stuff, so take notes, but we'll get to that pretty soon. Um, they might be a species, okay, but they might not be, right? Um, so they could be fossils, right? So they could be species. They could be a genus or a family. So it could be, you know, here's one family, here's another family. Okay. They could be, you know, English and Finnish. Okay. Um, also, not all taxes need to be contemporaneous. There's some, there's some really cool trees of, of flu viruses, where every year they will sequence the flu viruses. That are, popular, that are you know in the population at that time. Next year, see the again, and so forth. And you'll you'll often find is the flu that has evolved the most during a year, the one that takes off the next year. And without that, the reason it evolves the most is being passed around to most people, most chance for changes. Okay. Not that people are less immune to it, because it's changed so much. You guys, you actually see this tree, and that sort of tree is something like this. We're not all of you particularly the same. This might be all the tips in the year 2000, 2001, 2002. Right? Same thing for like HIV in a patient for the change of times. Any questions about that? Okay. Branch, also called an edge. Okay. It can have length. And that length can mean time or amount of character change, or probability of character change. Okay. If it's the use of time, it's cool. You can say, okay, when did these split? They split you know, in okay. And again, let's assume the single split is like, boom, the triangle appears to split. And actually, you know, not come slowly up, and so you would be less and less and less. It's a continuous process. You make it discrete. Okay, where they meet, we call it an internal node, or something like a node. Okay. This is also between a node or a terminal node. An internal node. Okay. Um, where edges meet. Okay. What we have are two center branches, which are known as bifurcating or fully resolved or dichotomous or good. Uh, nodes will be two different points. Why do they say good for dichotomous traits? Why would that be good? Okay, what does the tree represent? Here's of one species component. Where's the polytone move that we're expecting that? What? Estimations of splits, right? And it's implying that there's one split that became, you know, one lineage that led to three lineages immediately, or four lineages, right? So I have a tree like this. Because at this point in time, this species became three species. Right. We think most cases, you know, speciation happens with, you know, a split of two. Right? That's the simplest possible case. Right. And so often what we see, I mean, it's, it's in theory possible to have multiple speciation that's happening at once. So you have, you know, an island and you have all of a sudden two rivers coming across at the same time, like sea level rise and divide it that way. But I generally think that happens with, you know, a series of binary splits. Okay. But sometimes they're hard to detect. So imagine, you know, a tree like this, where we have 
That's between A, B, and C. That's between A and B. If this only happened, you know, this was an interval of half a million years, and it happened 100 million years ago, right? There's not going to be a lot of information that persists, you know, from that time, say, okay, A and B are unfortunately related and either is to C. Right? Change happening there. It's very hard to rep represent that, to figure that out. And so the way we deal with that in some cases is just represent that as a polytone. So we end up with A plus B, or A plus C, or, or C plus B. It's one of those, we can't tell which, but it's collapsed into polytoming. Polytoming is used to show lack of information sometimes. Okay, that makes sense? Yeah. Okay. So if you have a tree that's fully bifurcating, it can mean that you have enough data to, to estimate the tree well. But if you have no data, I know there's some tree, I just present it as a huge polytoming. And that shows me I have no information about which species broke up from the others first. Okay. Bad? Good. That's the most information. Okay. Assuming you have the right information. Okay. Right. So we remove the tree, it's down here. Which way does time go on this tree? Up. Yeah, so here is the Drawing the tree this way is a convention. Some people draw it this way. Um, some people in the state of draw it this way. Um, this class of flight can mostly draw it this way. Okay. A rooted tree has a node that represents the most recent common ancestor, or the least common ancestor, which is a nappy term. Um, and a rooted tree is called a directed graph, which shows direction of So, for example, this is a tree. It has branches, it has nodes, little nodes, right? Only one path and one point the other point of the tree. It's a tree. But we don't know if it could be, you know, it could be described here and then diversified, or it could be described over here and diversified. We can't tell the direction of change. Or the direction of the relationship. It's a commuted tree. Rooted trees are great because they play information about like, how things are changing over time. Okay? And um, the time kind of second. Any questions on that? Okay. One question you might have is how do you, how do you root a tree? Anyone know? Okay. We're going to root the mammal tree. Find where the mammal tree attaches to the rest of the vertebrates. And then they can do that often so you can help you. So you can say, okay, here I have my mammals, but there's also a branch here where I have fertile. Right? So I think that mammals are all groups of one ancestor. Right? It might be that the really huge mammals would have to be two. So you have A, B, C, D, E, to pull this down. With the turtle, A, and have B, and have C, and have D, and E. So then when that turtle touches here, it tells me that this is my most basic node. This sort of pulling the tree around from through it is hard to be manipulated at first. Um, like, you know, integrating the conduits in the process can be used to make a process of function. That's what's going back to the tree. And then she uses the tree. Okay. Um, okay. Clade, the term we use a lot. Okay. A clade is an ancestor and also sentence, what's called monophyletic. So example, this is a clade. So here's the ancestor down here, and here are all his descendants. Okay. Here's a clade too. This is an all his descendants. Okay. Here's one, but also here's one. OK? 
okay? Just different ancestors and descendants. Okay? We like clades. Why might we like clades? So like, for example, naming things now, most people will only name clades. So you only name, you know, if mammal, mammals are a clade. Reptiles are not a clade because they exclude certain groups. We don't like the term reptiles anymore. So why might people like this idea? So sort of a natural, it's a group of things that sort of all evolved from some ancestors. Whereas other groups um, are, you know, most of them evolved from an ancestor, but throwing some out. Like really weird ad hoc, like, oh, who do these but then throw out these? Right, so those groups have, have terms too. So a paraphyletic group is an ancestor, but some, but not all of its descendants. Right? So I say this ancestor, everyone but this guy. That's why And a polyphyletic group is even worse. Okay. So I'm going to include the ancestor in the okay. um, The only one distinction between polyphyletic and paraphyletic, both are just sort of treated as bad in modern taxonomy. Okay. They're not natural groupings. Okay. So, for example, fish. Yeah. Is a trout a fish? Is a shark a fish? Right. I mean, we believe it's a fish, right? Well, if that's the case, then so are you, if you want to name fish as a clade. Right? So about, you know, vertebrate phylogeny. And you have cartilaginous fishes, and you have bony fishes, and we're a kind of bony fish. Okay? And so, on the, like, like on the tree, the shark, trout, and human. Right? We call these two fish. about the dinosaur phylogeny you looked at earlier, right? You have things like, you know, like brontosaurs and stegosaurs, T. rex, and birds, right? These are extinct, they survive. If these are all dinosaurs, what the clade of dinosaurs actually includes all of these, right? Because T. rex can't push the bird from the dinosaur. And so it's other things about, you know, like, oh, it's so weird that dinosaurs, you know, had maternal care. Well, birds have maternal care. That's right? something that they're different. So it could be a, a shared trait all the way down the tree. There's maternal care. Maybe not, but, you know, but the shared history tells us something about, oh, look at those traits. Why do birds have scaly legs? Well, they came from a scaly leg group. Yeah. And the cool thing is now we look at, now there's lots of fossils showing, you know, dinosaurs, some dinosaurs had feathers. Not just like Archaeopteryx, but, you know, sort of things like, you know, like Velociraptor, fuzzy you know, Velociraptor, you know, feathers. Okay. Another question is rank, right? So I think it's Tennessee has teaching students where like one grade, what students are supposed to learn is, you know, kingdom, phylum, class. You know, King Philip came over for you know, figure out your favorite mnemonic device. <coughs> the thing is, those ranks are pretty arbitrary, right? So, is this a genus, or is this a genus, or is this a genus, or is this a genus? Right? Well, it's just a cutoff. There's a proposal a while ago to just have you know, genera is 10 million years, and family is 50 million years, and so forth. Um, it didn't really take off. Right? So, we still have genera. Like we're in the genus Homo. In the genus Pan, right? So we still have these terms, but you know what? What sets the levels? Are they comparable? Right? I can say, okay, well, I have 
you know, five, four genera of great apes, but I have, um, you know, one, one genus of astragalus, and astragalus has many more species. Isn't that cool? Well, it could have been around much longer. Right? So just the fact that, you know, the number of species in a genus, that sort of binning is a human construct, not a natural construct. Right? And so in the same way, the species is sort of a binning, too. Okay, so you should always think about what these terms actually mean before you compare them. Any questions? So I can't really say, okay, let's compare this genus to this genus, because they might not be equal. If you want to compare things, how can you compare things in biology? Well, you can do sister group comparisons in some way. Okay? So at this point in time, right down here, you do the same, same species. Right? Then I have split. And I have a red lineage and a blue lineage. Okay. If the red lineage, um, if the blue lineage has more species, well, it's not, it's not a fish in one species, but at the same age, the ancestor. So why would it have more species? And now I can do a comparison. Say, okay, well, you know, I've been controlling for everything. I've been controlling for all the shared ancestry down here, I'm controlling for time, it's been on time, and now I have more species here. So you can do tests and say, okay. For example, there was an early question of um, does herbivory promote speciation? So do insects that eat plants? Have more species than insects that eat other insects or insects that eat detritus. Right? So I have a lot of plants, insects and plants, but it could be that what you have is, you know, you know maybe insects especially eat plants. Right? You just have a few oddballs that become carnivorous. So you know, can't do anything else to say about what actually happens is you have a bunch of comparisons between things that eat plants and things that do not eat plants on the insect tree of life. If it was not embarrassed, we were going to go with the You can compare each of these with the simple sign points and say, okay, if you are herbivorous, you have more species than your sister. And so, which means this paper is about two years ago, uh, several years ago. You have five comparisons, each of the comparisons said yes, you have plenty of plants that have more birds. So, that may be enough. You have a you know, you slightly less than 10 or 5, so you can do it. You can do it, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. We controlled for this shared ancestry. So, a lot of times we're thinking about doing things with sister groups. Okay, so sister group is a term to learn there. There are other sister groups in the tree too, like that one, right? That's just sort of that, and that one. Those are sister groups. Okay. Um, taxa sister to the focal group. So it's further out taxa. It's known as known as outgroups. We talked about before, like with the turtle case. Okay, so they help root the tree. So in this case, if you really care about this part of the tree. Okay, so here's just showing you more about rooting a tree. Right, so here is a paper done by the Green Eyed Barter. Phylogeny of ants. Okay. And here's the under tree, you don't know which way is down. And it could have been, and they think the root could have occurred in many different places. Okay. And so they try attaching the root, and they thought you know, that was a thing about evolution, but also the right. Okay, and um, <coughs> if you do it this way, then it suggests that the root of the tree had ants live in very small colonies, okay, like many bees do. You can talk about what, how you figure that out later. Okay, like many small colonies. If you do it this way, it suggests that the root had, of ants had big colonies. Okay, which is very interesting. You know, it's like when ants first evolved, were they like solitary wasp after eggs, you know, a mother made some offspring? Or were they they start off already as huge, you know, big nests. Yeah. Which leads to different you know, implications for how they evolve, how they became dominant, and so forth. And so then it's just a question of rooting. Okay. More jargon. And again, sorry, this, I mean, the jargon is, is an upsetting to do, but you have to learn how to speak. Right? 
Um, so, homology, similarity to shared ancestry. Okay. So, we have four limbs, turtles have four limbs. Those four limbs are awesome. No, it's because our ancestors have four limbs. Okay. So, then there is homoplasy. Similarity, but not due to shared ancestry. Okay. So, what this is? Okay. This is a dolphin. Hey, look, and they have very similar dorsal fin. They have feet. They have the fin to the side. They have a tail. They breathe air. Right? Um, the breathing air is a homology. They come from, but they both come from air-breathing ancestors. But the other traits are homophones. So they evolved separately in the same form. Okay. Um, so, conversions can have a similar shape. Now, homophily can mislead you when, you think, when you're making up an evolutionary, when you're figuring out evolutionary history. Okay, okay. Well, this is a chimpanzee thing. We inherit from a shared ancestor. Right? Um, but other characters suggest that no, he's actually a kind of super wizard. Right? Like Albert, he's a super wizard. Um, <coughs> and so, what's happened is the shared selective pressure. Of how do you hunt fish in an aquatic environment if you're a terrestrial you know, tetrapod led to this fever in some form. Okay. This is a really cool example of evolution and, process, and progress. Right. You start with two different starting points and then a very similar endpoint because of the shared forces. Okay. Questions about that? Okay. Here's other terms for characters. Plesiomorphy, an ancestral primitive character state. Okay, we run some another derived state. So sharks living in water. Um, so sharks live in water because their ancestors live in water. So it's the ancestral state, plesiomorphic state, relative to living on land. Symplesiomorphy, this plesiomorphic shape with the two more taxa. So sharks and rays. Okay, and apomorphy. Is a derived or advanced character state. Then it's another ancestral state. So whales live in water, where the other tetrapods that's an apomorphy. Syn apomorphy, the apomorphy is shared by two or more taxa. Ot apomorphy is an apomorphy with this one taxon. Okay? Syn apomorphies are great because they help tell us about shared ancestry. Right? So we have four limbs, turtles have four limbs, bats have four limbs. But the synapomorphy, a shared derived trait, is our ancestors having four limbs. Right? It tells something about you know, what our ancestor was, right? what the relationship is. So it shows that like, bats were more to us than they are to insects, because right? we show the synapomorphy of four limbs. Okay? And this is one way of inferring a phylogeny. Okay? Now, one thing you shouldn't do is like, sort of you know, primitive, advanced, you know, by that to you, which kind of phone do you want? You want a primitive phone or advanced phone? And they go ahead and go through advanced phone. So he says, like, connotations in modern speech of, like, advanced is better, right? Um, here it's evident, okay? So it could be that, <coughs> you know, the primitive trait, you know, like sharks live in water, if, you know, there's mass extinction on land and sharks do fine in it, you know, this is a great trait to have, right, for, you know, for your resistance, right? Even though the living land is the more advanced trait. So all it tells you is which came first, not which is better. Okay. One note, correct plural, one taxon, two taxa. Okay. I'll fail you in this class if you make that mistake once in a while. But not really. At least, at least twice. Also, genus, genera. There's a great book about Nabokov. I had to stop reading because I kept talking about genuses. Uh, genera, please, please. Okay. <coughs> Other terms that come from Gould um, and Berta, but we can get back to this, who is a famous evolutionary biologist, paleontologist, uh, are these terms. So, adaptation, natural selection shapes the character for its current use. Okay. Um, exaptation are characters whose origins came from something else and are so co opted. 
evolution is always tinkering. Right? So I was saying, okay, it would be great in 10 million years to be able to fly. Let's, let's start working on that now. Right? And then once, once, very, once it gets good enough, you can start flying. That's not how it works. It's sort of, you get a tray, and then it can either drift, you know, by accidental change increase in frequency, or it could be serving some other purpose. So like, our friend this bird, right? Africa, the black hole um, takes the business of shading its eyes very it's, seriously you know, indeed. Evolve wings to help cover and help hunt better? Well, no. Uh, it's exaptation for shading. Right, so wings evolve. Um, we have to have for why wings evolve. Their heart function is like Maybe um, cutting out reflections and, uh, is not the only reason for doing uh, this. Many fish prefer to swim beneath an overhanging bank or a tree so that they can't be easily seen yeah, from above. Like so perhaps they deliberately... Okay, so here's evolution as shown by Wikipedia. Uh, this is a very cool diagram. Uh, it's a very cool diagram. 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 Progress going from us back to more primitive things like this. Right? And so, you know, we stand in the pinnacle of evolution, right? Um, <coughs> and this is often shown on a tree, things like this. Right? So we have some you know, bacteria, and a lancelet, and a fish, and a salamander, maybe more and more like us, more advanced, moving up to us. Right? And it is a valid tree. This tree is correct. Right? The interpretation of it as these having further traits and this having other new traits is true. We've been evolving for some amount of time. So you can have, so, you know, unusual, bacteria have all these unique traits that we have evolved in. Okay, and say for us. Okay. And so, you shouldn't be misled to this by this, and thinking that, like, whoever's on this tip has the most, has undergone the most change. Okay. So, for example, this tree is also correct. So, let's make Chuck B move over. Okay. And show, you know, this tree. This is also a valid tree. Okay. So here, you know, Charles Darwin is outgrew sister to octopods. Right? And if you think of like being primitive, then the cockroach is once again on that tree. Okay. Well, look, the cockroaches are cool and they're subsocial, they mix with each other and they have really cool traits. But you know, so are dragonflies, so are millipedes. Okay. They've all had time to evolve their own traits. So we shouldn't think of this as, you know, when this split happened. This is the same as this. Um, you can say that you know, the first tetrapods on land looked like salamanders because you know, salamanders broke off early. That's not necessarily true. They haven't evolved for as long as they have. So you shouldn't take this as an Questions about that? This sort of mistake comes in people make all the time. Okay. We even have, actually have terms for things like basal taxa, which means the taxa in the brain is off down here and right here. And the basal taxa are often thought to be primitive. Right? That's basically a function of how you draw your tree and what the taxa are coming from the tree. Right? So on this tree, Charles Darwin's basal. On the other, it's what would be called advanced or derived. Right? But characters can be basal, but not taxa. Okay. Unless you happen to have like an ancestral Questions about any of this? Okay, so look at the, so I'll put this up as a PDF. Um, this is sort of jargon you should be able to, you know, use use in essays and questions on tests and things like that. I might mean, ask you a few questions, like, you know, define some pseudomorphy, but just, which just, just check, check, test basic knowledge, just having it as part of your working vocabulary, so you're thinking about things as, is that an apomorphy, you know, um, what's the relationship, if I say, look at that node, you should be like, what, you know, I'm pointing out, okay. Um, this makes communication better, is it, it makes you better able to think about what possibly is going on. Okay, great, thank you all.